Hi, I'm Dan. I'm Will. I'm Ice. Welcome to the Forks Drum Closet video podcast. Mm. We are here today hanging out with two wonderful folks, Uh, Matt Iceman and Will Denton. Hello. Hi. Thank you guys both for being here. Just a quick update, like always, we do. Uh, Shop is back open uh, Monday through Saturday. Monday through Friday is 9.30 to 6. Saturday is 10 to 5. Obviously, we're still practicing social distancing, so everybody... We recommend wearing a mask, of course. Clearly, by um, how close we are at the table. Sure, sure. <laughs> well, you we know, may not we, be uh, we, uh, at the moment. We're not. Well, we screened at each other when we came in. That, we we took temperatures, right. and yeah. so safety has been observed. <laughs> um, anyway, normal shop hours are back, so come see us, of course. Mm-hmm. And uh, dudes, we'll, we'll get right into it. Thanks for being here, guys. How are you? Oh my gosh, thanks for having me. Yeah. Uh, I get I get a little emotional every time I come to Forks. It's kind of a it's an elevated experience. It really is. Okay. Yeah. Why would you say that though? Dude? Well, uh, I'm one of the lucky schmoes that has had the Forks experience kind of on both sides of the counter, you know. Uh, my formative years in Nashville, I got to work, you know, with Gary and Paul and the guys. And, and uh, you I think, know. I think it's as good a time as any to show. Yeah. Oh, yeah. hey, this is just mean. No, this is great. Nope. No, this is this is history right here because, I mean, not only is, is wonderful <laughs> Will here, but, I mean, Joe Hibbs is in this picture. Yeah, Joe. God rest. God rest. Um, yeah. Not only Paul, who we had on a recent episode, yep. Gary himself, another amazing guy, Matt Green. Matt. But you guys were hanging out with Simon Phillips at this point. Simon. Clinic. Yes, we were. So, yeah, <laughs> yeah. You, you've you've ha- had amazing history here. Yeah, I mean, uh, and, and the fashion sense I was displaying is obviously on – what is it on fleek? Yeah, dude. I mean, it <laughs> is was. That a thing I don't know. I'm I'm in my fifties. Okay, uh, come on, dude. Well, I mean, but hey, you got a fork shirt on. Yeah, it's like yeah. A pair of jeans. It's pretty cool. Yeah, tucked right in there in those jeans. No <laughs> belt. So yeah, yeah. So anyway, that was nineteen ninety. Everyone. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Mark. I appreciate it. Yeah, there do it that. It, it says yeah. it's nineteen ninety one. So <laughs> when did when did you start here? Well, let's see. Uh, man, I moved to Nashville uh, in 1990 to go to school at Belmont. I, I transferred in from Valdosta State. And I mean, just the weirdest thing, not long after uh, you know I got here, I, I met Gary Forkham you know, on a Sunday. And and then I um, I came to an Anton Fig clinic. Awesome. Uh, yeah, dude. And I, I have a little story. I wound up buying one of the crash symbols he used, you know, one of the Zildjian A's that he used at the, at the clinic. And I remember I, I got so excited to tell people that, hey, Anton Fig played this. It started out as one that I bought from the clinic. And then I think a couple of weeks later, it was like, yeah, I think he had it shipped down from New York, you know. And then and I'm pretty sure by, you know, a month after this, it was like, yeah, he played it on the show all the time. He just brought it with him and I, I got it, you know. But uh, that's, uh, you know, between just meeting Gary and then seeing him at the clinic, um, man, he offered me a job. And I mean, very quickly in town, I found myself like just, you know, here at Forest Drum Closet. And uh, every day was kind of like, you know, Christmas for me. I mean, not only was I meeting all these guys I'd see in Modern Drummer or, you know, guys I'd heard on records and they were asking me, you know, to get them a pair of sticks or whatever, you know. And um, but I also got to unpack all these amazing drums and cymbals every day. I mean, I literally came to work excited every day. And, and I had so many good memories and good laughs with, you know, Gary and the guys. And so, you know, and I, 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 man, here I go. This is just a complete love fest. But I'll tell you, the whole arc of my life changed because of Forks, because Paul Snyder came go. in one day with a business card, dude. I mean, he came in with his business card. Yeah. He said, hey, my wife was working at, you know, the restaurant last night. She waited on this guy. He gave her this card. I, you know, I thought she might be interested. And, man, it was this hastily scribbled business card that said, looking for drummer to play rap, hip-hop music with DC Talk. I didn't know who this guy was or really that much about the band. But, um, man, I, I'll tell you this. I, you know, that just changed the whole trajectory for me, and that business card – you know, is on the very first page of my like my scrapbook of all you know the tour memories. It's it stands alone. You know, it's just page one by itself. Wow. And man, Paul's wife, you know, waited on this guy. I, I've, I've thought about man if he had gone to get barbecue that night, he would have never met her. Sure. I would have never you know just all yeah. this stuff. And um, you know, if that hadn't happened, you know, we all would go you know our own paths and things would happen. But man, that that just changed sure. for everything for me right there. And so, shout out to Brenda Brenda Woosley, Paul's uh, wife. Exactly, she knows yeah. what to do. Yeah. So, um, and you know, and then and every time I come back in the forks, you know, uh, I I mean, on I, you know, as a customer, or whatever, I, I always have just felt like, yeah, I belong. You know, this is my this is my place. So. 
Well, you know, I mean, like you just said, you know, hanging out with Gary and the guys. I mean, Gary Forkham, I mean, I know you too, Matt. I mean, he he, he loosely is like our drum stepfather in this town. I know. Sure. No doubt. A lot of us, yeah. you know. So that's, yeah. it's great that you got that experience. And I think a, a lot of us are, are I think everybody that's worked here is, is feels very fortunate to have known him and Melissa for sure. And, yeah. Um, yeah. You mentioned the, the DC talk thing. Um, kind of why we brought, I mean, not directly brought Matt, <laughs> Matt Iceman in, but Matt, Matt and I, Matt Iceman, a great drummer here in they town, played the, with David yeah, Dale and so a good. bunch of other folks. Um, Spider Wolf. Spider Wolf. <laughs> TJ, <laughs> what up, dude? Come on yeah. now. Um, we'll see. Those, you guys got to check out Spider Wolf. That's something. I've had the. We need to do a show again. Anytime you want. Soon. Anytime Soon. you want. Best nights of my life was dude, seeing you guys so play. Good. Um, Matt and I have developed a friendship over the past, uh, God, 15 years or however long it's been. And uh, you coming yeah. in here, maybe a little less than that, but that's about right. I moved here in 06. Okay. So, yeah. Okay. So where, so, I mean, you never you haven't <coughs> yet worked here. Maybe one day we'll have, we'll get yeah, to I don't be know I, if you, you guys will have me. Sure. We'd I love to. I don't think I'm cool enough to work. I here, think man. you're probably too cool. No. But, uh, but so you never working here, but like, so you moved to town, you said in 06. Yes. Okay. Yeah, I moved here in August of 06. So uh, right after I started. So, yeah, we have known each other. Is it really? For, yeah, okay. yeah. Wow. We've known each other for like 14 years, yeah. Wow. So, yeah. Um, well, I'm just going to say this before I talk any more about me. Like, Tell me. Hmm. I think every drummer has like a Ringo Starr moment in their life. And if you're of a certain age or generation, like it was probably Ringo. But like everybody has that drummer that they saw and they were like, man, I want to do that. That looks like so much fun. Sure. I really mm-hmm. want to do that the rest of my life. And so when Marshall asked me to do this, yeah, heck yeah, I was like, I'll do it. But like, let's have will on there. Oh man. Yes. And he was like, okay. And I honestly didn't think it would happen. But like two days ago, Marshall was like, yeah, hey, we're going to do it. I was like, sweet. <laughs> yes. All that to say, I grew up in a very like conservative Christian home. Like, my my parents are really into music. My mom plays piano. She sings. She was really into like oldie stuff, like 50s, 60s stuff. So like earliest drumming influence was Hal Blaine, but I didn't know it then. Right. And I really wasn't playing drums at the time that I was listening to that stuff. But Beach Boys, Mamas and Papas, all that stuff. But I remember being at a friend's house when I was in seventh grade. So I started playing drums, sixth grade band. Seventh grade, I'm at his house. He's a pastor's kid. He has the Narrow is the Road long form VHS like tour video, right? Yeah. Yep. Oh, yeah. And like two thirds of the way through, I mean, the whole video is awesome, but two thirds of the way through, it's like the band feature part. Have you ever seen it? I, you know, dude, dude. his free, (laughs) no, he always says, oh, dude. (laughs) Definitely, I have. And I mean, the, this is one of the reasons I played Pearl drums was because of this guy. Same here. That's what? I, I wanted sure. to play hey, Pearl so bad oh, for a gosh. long time. I couldn't time. stand how cool the kit looked. Oh. Yes, <laughs> on the on the old black eighty rack, right? Like, totally. You're welcome. Yep. Dude, thank you. Thank you. Bro. Yeah. <laughs> the, you had your Pisces like higher like, than this like roof. A mile oh, high, dude. But the solo you played <laughs> and like just how much fun it looked like you were having, and I was like, that. That's what what I want to do. Man, I and I, and so. <laughs> I remember that, the video. I remember that was these that was moments. my Ringo moment. Oh, oh my god! And so, well, thank you. Followed quickly by like a couple years later on the the Welcome to the Freak Show <laughs> tour video, and I was like, oh, this is even cooler because yeah. your hair was like longer, and like that was like a thing that I was like, well, my parents would never let me have long hair. Sure. But like this is a Christian band, mom. Like they have long hair. <laughs> totally. Oh, wow. And I know I'm making you uncomfortable, oh, which is why I'm thanks. saying this. Yeah, but thanks. like, thanks so much. I was like, all right, I, I want to play drums. I want to move to Nashville. That's what I want to do. Like yeah. I want to be on a bus with people I love and just get on wow. stage every night. Yeah. So well. I had no idea how I was going to make that happen, but like <laughs> you, you're the reason I do this. You're the reason I live here. And, no. and, and I know not, I, I say that to you all the time and I, I don't like to fanboy, but like every now and then I'll be at home and like, we'll be texting or whatever. And Amy, my wife will be like, who are you texting? I'll be like, just will. She's like, is that still just like the weirdest thing to you ever? Oh, like your childhood gosh. drumming hero, like you can just text or like go have lunch with. And I'm like, yes, it's absolutely weird, but I try not to think about it. Cause it's the coolest thing. Yeah. It's really well, cool. that means a lot. So, and if, if I really am 
the reason you're playing drums. You're welcome, world, because I, I <laughs> no. think the world's a better place having you play uh, drums. Well, I agree with that. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. But gosh, a hundred percent, he's in the same boat. Because I was, I was never like a DC Talk collector. Or, sure. Or, you know, huge. You know, I had you know whatever posters on my wall, but uh, no question, especially the long hair thing you're talking about. <laughs> I definitely put you in the category, like watching like the old Smells Like Teen Spirit video. Mm-hmm. When I was oh kid. my gosh! And, and like Dave's whipping his hair around, and then <laughs> yeah. I used to watch, you know. Um, Sean Kenny with Allison Chan. Yeah. Oh, and he had dude, the DLB yeah. kit looking cool and yeah. I was like, okay, I get it. And then like yeah. you know, had the thing, I was like, okay, this has to happen. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And here we are. See, so, you someday. committed. Someday. I did have long hair for a while. Yeah. I've seen yeah. pictures of you with long yeah. hair. Yeah, for it was, sure. It was not that long, but it was long. Yeah, it was <laughs> so I miss mine. Thank you for thank <laughs> you for ruining both of our lives and turning me into a hippie and Yeah, yeah so, you're welcome. So thanks, Will. Anyway, yeah. Yeah. So, happy to help. So no, it's it's super cool that this moment and I kinda I kinda told you, Ice, that and maybe I didn't try to i didn't want to freak anybody out so i was talking to him i I was like listen the whole thing has got to be because this is like you were just saying like texting will in the middle of the night and getting to like it's like when well not in the middle of the night let's not get weird well (laughs) it it has gotten weird i'm pushing i've tried to block you hey will are you awake i'm I'm pushing i'm pushing 40 now so 10 o'clock's the middle (laughs) that's the night night. 10 o'clock man i'm in bed by nine so but it's it's a very similar situation i'm going to exploit you again yeah because like this is a this is your personal photo right yeah this uh yeah, I, I'm. I'm. Gosh, I'm turning this into a Forks Drum Closet love fest. But Which I brought. Well, it is a Forks Drum well, Closet I, podcast. I brought this. I brought <laughs> this picture. I brought this picture, I brought this picture because I think it pretty uh, wonderfully demonstrates the sense of community. Let me just tell you guys, I was just walking in probably to replace the last set of moon gels I lost <laughs> for the nine thousandth time, and I came in on this little round table. It was Tommy Wells, and and again, when I was working at Forks, Tommy Wells came in and just treated me like a human being and was nice to me and he later was you know he was a uh, he threw in a good word for me with the peisty people and just was always an encourager ron ganaway is a bad bad man on the drums and i always just marveled when he would come in and you know even he if he was asking me to you know just go get him a drum head or something but he would talk to me and just ask me how i was jerry croon another studio legend so i walked in one day and and just looking for something that I needed, I wound up, we probably stood around for I 45 minutes, I bet. And they allowed me to just kind of, they, maybe I was just the younger guy. Who they, they wanted to, you know, see how wrong I could be about stuff. But I mean, he really, they really just welcomed me. It was like a complete, unplanned moment that turned out to be so wonderful we were also happy to be there and gary was a big facilitator and i this picture just hangs on my wall and i smile every time i see it because um it just personifies to me the you know the community that we have here uh drummers first and foremost but forks you know just gives you that place the the meeting place the opportunity to talk to people you look up to and admire so yeah i brought that for this very reason just to- Totally, and and so th- this picture, the reason I brought it up, not only for those wonderful uh, anecdotes, but um, also too, it, this is between you guys here was was why it was like Marshall was like this is what has to happen, and, and it was like Ice, we got to have you talk to Will because oh. it, no, this it, it would mean the same thing if I was sitting here with you know Jerry Croon, like you're yeah. saying, Jerry. I mean, a lot of people think Lars Ulrich is my favorite drummer, and he sure sure is, <laughs> but the real unsung hero in my life, number one favorite, is Jerry Croon. Right. So anytime I'm texting Jerry about anything it's just a trip i'm like i'm yeah. literally still like the 12 year old kid sitting yeah. in the studio watching like uh, the no. jerry croon yep. lay down something and i'm just saying hey you know what and i'll just ask him a dumb question and he'll <laughs> say this that the other kid and i'm like wow you know like, yeah. Yeah. i can't believe i'm buddies with my hero you know so i was like okay it's very important i mean maybe this will end up being a series maybe we can get some other guys in with their hero but i thought it was very oh, cool because i mean anybody can sit here and say oh what kind of snare head did you play sure. on this you know yeah. but i think it i think it was very cool idea and it was really marshall's idea to have oh boy thanks marshall yeah you know Gosh. so i so okay so you used to work at forks you've been a long time forks customer everybody plays drums it's all great yeah yeah <laughs> matt do you have any Questions that you want to have recorded on video that you're asking your hero. Oh my! Man, gosh. well, you know what's what so kind funny? of snare side that you <laughs> use? <laughs> no. See, I don't, I don't really care about that. Like yeah. mm-hmm. he and I have talked a lot about right. gear, and I, yep. I've always been very cautious to like. I don't want to fanboy you too hard because I don't want to be weird. I could very easily be sure. like, dude, what Pisces were you playing on this video? <laughs> well, just blame like, it on forks. You can <laughs> just he yeah. can you can blame it on. A, <laughs> but like. I don't know, man. I, I kind of want you to talk about just like 
your career? Because I feel like you've experienced a lot of different sides or like, I don't know, the ups and downs of the music business being a side man. Yeah. Because yeah. I feel like you went from playing with DC Talk at like the peak, the height of their fame, probably. And then you went and played. Was Stephen Curtis right after that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, more or less? Yeah. Uh huh. And then, see, this, and this, I feel bad. Like, is you are the reason I do this, but I'm not going to pretend to know everything that, I, like, every record you've ever been on or anything. <laughs> I wouldn't expect but to, gosh. You also played with Leanne Rhymes for a while, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh huh. And, and then, like, some quote unquote, like, smaller artists, right? Did you do Jane yeah. Deer Girls for a while? And yeah. Mickey yeah. Guyton? Yep. Yep. And the farm and the farm, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah which I think uh, the other thing I think is funny is we have a lot of bass player friends in common. Yes, we do. Yeah. Shout out to Caleb Mundy, Larry yeah, Kraft, yeah, yeah, yeah. Nigel. Yeah. Uh -huh. Corn. Yeah. Woo -hoo. Corn. Yeah. Yeah. We do. Um. So I always love talking to them about you because they're always like, "Man, I freaking love playing with Will." And I'm <laughs> like, "Yeah." Oh man. What do they say about Will? Was there besides yeah, him what being do just they a say? really handsome, <laughs> sweet man? What yeah. do they say about him? I mean, obviously, just that that is playing is always solid and it feels good and like there's yeah. never any question of where he's putting yeah. stuff. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Which mm -hmm. I really wow. feel like th that's kind of the highest compliment you can get, especially from a bass player, sure. but from There's anybody some, like. Yeah. I gave up a long time ago trying to be like the dude with the fastest hands or, or whatever. Like I, I don't even care about, cause this is how I view the people that I like playing with. I don't care about being the best player. You know, I want to be your favorite player. Like the people that I really like playing with. I don't know if they're the best bass player or the best guitar player or whatever. They're just the, my favorite people that play that instrument. Mm -hmm. And I know that they make me play better. You I know? get that. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I feel like the guy that's the best isn't really that much fun to play with. Well, I mean, right. You know what I mean? You know what I mean? Like, I, I mean, yeah. I, you know, when I when I worked here, it seemed like every every week a new guy would walk in that was brand new to town, and you know, he'd sit down and just you know rail on the drums and you know, just try to impress everybody. I mean, because auditions happen at drum shops. Absolutely, we hire each other. <laughs> we yeah. really do. Yeah, yeah. This is who you want to impress. But I. I mean, I, I became really, it became readily apparent to me that, you know, that the chops and everything were just a small part of the of the whole package. You know, what would be a successful, you know, a reliable touring musician in town or session guy. I mean, um, I, had a, I had a really interesting experience with a, uh, a guy I consider a friend now, but I when I was 18 years old, I went to a concert that his band was playing, and... Uh, it was, it was a big show, but casual enough where afterwards I could walk up sort of just right to him and, you know, say hello and yeah. just fanboy, you know. <laughs> and uh, he was actually tearing down his own drums. And, and I remember I was just like, man, I just really enjoyed the show. I was staring at the floor. I, wouldn't look, <laughs> I was like, man, uh, just that was amazing and blah, blah, blah. And he kind of looked at me and goes, hey, man, that's great. Y you want to tear down my drums for me? And I'm like... <laughs> Yeah, I do, and um, and it took me about you know I don't know uh, ten minutes. I was just putting stuff away, and I and I was like, wait a minute, that guy just really yeah, yeah. <laughs> kind of just like you know dissed me or whatever. But all that to say, I man, I I don't know. I I've kind of felt like you. I always wanted to be the best drummer I could be. Um, there were guys I idolized and guys I tried to sound like, and then at the end of the day, I just really felt like. Well, if chops are only a small, small part of it, uh, what are the other things that make for a, a guy mm. that's going to go out and work and work and work? And I just, man, I, I just wanted to be a nice guy that was dependable, and I wanted to be able to play whatever was asked of me. And, um, yeah, the the DC Talk thing, honestly, it was such a, just a surprise to me. I literally went to that thing thinking I was just going to get an audition because I had not had an audition in Nashville yet. And I, I really just thought, okay, notch in the belt. Now I know what a Nashville audition's like, you know, okay, okay. So check, you know, be ready, better prepared for the next one. And then like, man, I get a call like uh, a week and a half later asking for callbacks. And just to give you an idea, you know, the business card that, that I got from Paul that day when I did call, I was breathless. I was just so excited. I mispronounced the guy's name. I just slobbered all over the phone. I was like, 
Um, anyway, they let me come in as basically the sound check guy. I came in first. I was like the very first guy. Half the guys in the band weren't even there yet. I just literally sat down and played along with the CD. I mean, that's all I did. Nice. I like three songs and I'm like, all right, see ya. Mm-hmm. And I was like, okay, well, that was kind of weird. Uh, there weren't any other musicians, <laughs> but I, okay. But then when I got a call, you know, a week later, I was like, oh my gosh, I, I really didn't think, I, I'm not being like false humility. I just didn't think I really had a chance. I just was trying to get the experience. So I dug in and I really prepared. And then when I showed up for the second audition, um, there were other musicians there. We played the three or four songs we had to learn. Then we just did like this jam session and played for a long time. And it was just really a comfortable situation. Like I, I was like, I like this stuff so much. And you know where, you know where Corky's barbecue is in Brentwood. Okay. Well, I was, I was there. It was right before Christmas holiday. Uh, I was checking my messages. Oh, wait. Yeah, I was calling home to check. I was calling my answering machine, if that tells you anything, checking my messages. And I had this just this really uh, quick message that said, Hey, Will, it's Chad from Chapel Hill. You got the gig. Call me on Monday. And I literally lost, I officially lost my mind in Corky's barbecue. And I went around and I pretty much hugged every (laughs) single person I knew. I high fived complete strangers. And uh, and everyone thought I said I'd gotten the ZZ Top gig, and so there were some people that were really excited for me, and uh, you know, um, but I, I don't know. That whole thing still seems like a, a surreal experience because yeah, they they were man, it it was a fun gig. I'll just tell you that. I think the first three or four weeks out on the road, you know, I just kind of lost my mind at at the end of every show. I was because yeah. it was so overwhelming to get to do that, and. Uh, you know, it it wasn't it wasn't magical. I didn't I didn't start levitating off the ground or anything. Sure. You know, it was just it was a gig, but it was really fun music. It was so much energy, and um, I, as as far as the drumming was concerned, I just got to beat the crud yeah. out of the drums, and I had so much fun. Looked man. awesome on those videos. Man, we're, we're, you had two kids like we're going like yes, yeah, <laughs> that's what needs to happen. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I mean that was a that was a really uh, amazing four or five years of my life and the Stephen Curtis thing you know it was an opportunity I felt like I, I should I should take it was a different it was a different thing stylistically I wanted a sure. different thing you know um, and Stephen was such a good guy to his band we got to play on a bunch of his records he made us always feel like a part of things um, which in this town is yeah rare. that's super that's well super I mean cool. it is I mean and I understand it, I've always wondered this yeah. like when you went to that gig did you know it was going to be like that or or were you just thinking it was going to be like another sideman thing? Or was it presented to you in a way of like, hey, you're going to come in like as a band member? No, I okay. mean, it was never presented okay. like that. It was a side guy gig. Okay. But I mean, just to that guy's credit, that's, yeah. how, he, that's how he treats his players. That's how that's he makes cool, it man. feel. Yeah. Um, uh, I mean, and I'm sure the first record we went to do, I mean, I'm, I know he had to go back to bat for us quite a bit. Yeah. I, I know he did. In fact, I understand. I really understand why the label wouldn't want to do that, you know, and take that chance. You're spending money. If the guys aren't going to be able to play it, you're losing money and you're losing time. Sure. And, and it's just a big risk. But Steven really went to bat for us. And um, I'm always, you know, especially grateful to him for that. Um, I got to play on some of, you know, his bigger recordings, and I still listen to it and go, man, that snare drum's behind. Oh, my gosh, you know that. That's yeah. where you want it, man. I'm yeah. trying to get well, my snare well, drum behind. Well, Golly. No, not, not the good behind, <laughs> like way, way, way back there, but uh, or whatever. So, yeah. Um, but uh, I, keep going here. Ask me some well, more questions. Like, how long how long were you with Steven? Ten years. I mean, it was a long time. And did you start that in 97, 98? Uh, it was 96. Yeah. 96? Yeah. Okay, wow. Yeah. And honestly, uh, I remember uh, during the course of my time with him, I started giving his son, Will Franklin, some drum lessons. And I remember thinking, man, this kid's really good. I'm, I'm actually going to teach myself out of a gig some, <laughs> yeah. someday. And, and sure yeah. enough, I mean, Stephen called me uh, at the end of the, uh, it was the, the end of the All Things New tour. And he said, hey, listen, I got a chance to take both my boys out on the road with me. Yeah. And, you know, they're both like Caleb's a great guitar player, Will's playing drums. And he said, I really, I got to do it. And I said, absolutely, you do. I would do the same thing if I could go out and tour yeah. You know, yeah. with my kids. So that was kind of the end of that. But it was an amicable, wonderful experience for me. The whole That whole thing, man, was a good experience. And then I, two weeks later, I got a call to go out with Leanne. And, and oh, that, wow. Okay. Yeah. So... Man, go figure. I, I don't. Mean, I don't think I realized that those gigs were that close. Yeah, they were. It was all pretty like compacted together. So there that, was not a lot. Would have been like oh six. 
Yeah. Oh, during the year I moved here. Oh. Yeah. There you go. Mm-hmm. Oh, the universe is wild like that, <laughs> yeah. isn't it? How about that? Yeah. And Leanne was a sweetheart to me. Sure. It really was. Oh, and yeah. that voice. Yeah. Hearing that voice in my ears was mm-hmm. quite an experience. Wow. So, yeah. A, a minute ago, you, you'd said kind of when you approach gigs, um, just, you know, because chops weren't everything, so you thought what you could do differently around there. Um, mm-hmm. Both of you guys, I, it was kind of a question in my brain Dave, when he had dave maddox i don't know if either one of you saw his clinic here but i thought something I that, that was he was great really, i wish i would have it was yeah. pretty amazing uh, yeah. he, he said one of his philosophies was when he goes into a gig he wants to do everything he can do to, to not be the problem yeah so yeah. if there's going to be a problem he doesn't want it to be him do you guys ever go into gigs now because you're both very experienced players with with great gigs under your belts do you do you try to just i mean because you're obviously very experienced like i said but you're trying to be as open as you can to the situation but do you ever bring in because that's kind of a preconceived concept of going in and not knowing where the music but just knowing that you're going to sort of try to disappear into the minutia of the gig and just provide like that how do you guys i guess approach these types of gigs do you guys go in with any headspace already not like a funk gig or a rock gig or whatever mm-hmm. i'm saying that like do you go in and say okay i'm gonna go in i'm gonna be i'm gonna just try to be laid back i'm gonna be cool because you gotta be friends with who you're playing with yeah you're gonna be on the bus for 23 hours and shows one hour you know is that a weird question no um, no not at all but i, I don't when know he said I've that i thought really it was thought about it he said it, when he said it, i was like, wow that's an interesting way to approach it to never try to be the problem I, I love that. I, I must be doing it wrong because I feel like I'm the problem all the time. <laughs> yeah. I, I think it's sort of just synonymous. The drummer's going to be the problem. I mean, I mean, some way or another. But I I don't know that I put that much thought into it, although I really respect that mindset. I, I do. I, I think you, you really can't know what what kind of situation you're stepping into you can listen to the music and you can get a feel for things and you could even you know just really immerse yourself in the artist's history and their back catalog and go okay this is where they've been this is where they are now i'm gonna you know make a you know an informed guess as to what they're really looking for but you really don't know and i again if, can i tell one more story about this yeah okay please, please. <laughs> well, dude, that is why I'll, you're I'll, here I'll, t- I'll tell you i'll tell you where um i th- i think i made a uh i made the wrong decision uh uh let me think what year was this um i'm so sorry it would have been somewhere in the in the mid 90s i got a chance a very last minute chance to audition for shania twain's band and uh because two of the guys in steven's band had already gone on to 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 wind up in her band and they were kind of giving me a little bit of like well they've listened to this guy and this guy and this guy and man mutt lang really likes it just like the record and i'll tell you what i did i said okay I get it. I learned the parts, and I said, um, but he's heard 30 guys play it all the same. You know, I, I assume they all did. Or not, and I'm not, I'm not taking anything away from their playing. I'm just saying if that's what he wanted and they knew that, then, you know, I know this is the mindset that I've got to put on. But, I mean, I got in there, and I, I played a song or two, and then I got to this one song that had a guitar solo, and it was just a, you know, bell on the ride cymbal, just quarter notes. And I thought, well, you know, um, I'm going to try something different here. I'm going to see if I can raise the, you know, up the ante. And, man, I went to the China symbol. Ooh. All right, let me tell you what happened. So I did I did the whole song and then just laid into this China symbol, which is a mistake in any situation now, <laughs> let's be honest. But I'm so proud to tell you that Mutt Lane came over to me and he had the very delicate, I don't know, South African accent. He was like, Will, man, that symbol, that <laughs> That was awesome. That that is an awesome symbol. If you are auditioning for Metallica, <laughs> and uh, and I was like, cool. You you know those guys, right? And, <laughs> and uh, so so I got you know. I mean, it wasn't like he threw me out. You know, and said never. You'll never work in this town again. But yeah. I mean, I don't know that it cost me the gig or not. But I mean, I definitely thought I'm going to try this, and I turned out to be the problem. So well. you know, you never really can know. I just. I feel like you have to bring your personality to the gig. Yeah. You, you have to. Because, I mean, if you don't bring something that's uniquely yours, I mean, anybody can do it. And I and if you find yourself in a gig where somebody wants it to sound just like the record, man, you're, you're going to be done, donezo with that in a year. You're going to be hating your life, yeah. I, I feel. I mean, it kind of just made me think of something, but... If, if I can tell a quick story. <laughs> you're both here to tell <laughs> you're stories. You're both, yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> When I got on the David gig, 
Hubert Payne. Yes. Phenomenal Hubert, drummer. Wonderful yeah, person. Was, on, gosh, the, was on the gig before me. Yeah. Okay. And Blaine Reedy was the bass player at the time. Great bass player. Mm. Love you, Blaine. He's not there anymore. But um, when I first got on that gig, <clears throat> we were doing shows. And, like, I had board tapes and I had records, right? So Reed, the band leader, was like, well, like, learn it more like the board tape because some of the arrangements are a little different. And, you know, just kind of cop Hubert's parts until you get comfortable, right? And Hubert wasn't, like, doing anything, like, technically that I couldn't do. But, like, we just – our natural pocket doesn't sit the same. Hmm. No one's does, really. No, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. But, you know, I was, like, trying to, to trying to kind of do what he was doing and maybe play some fills, like, orchestrate them the way he would, which was, like, unnatural for me. Sure. And the first three or four months, it was, like, every night on the bus, Blaine would be like, man, you know, Hubert, he used to do this here, he used to do that. And, like, I didn't feel like the shows were going very well. And I was yeah. like, man, I'm going to lose this gig, and I don't really want to lose a gig. I freaking love this gig. And after a while, I just remember having this conversation. And I wasn't, like, mad. I wasn't upset. I didn't yell at him. But I just kind of said, hey, Blaine, I'm not Hubert. And I obviously got this gig, so David likes my playing. I'm just going to play these songs the way I would play them. And then if it doesn't work, then we can talk. And after that, like... David started like really physically emoting on stage, like getting into the shows and mm -hmm. it, all of a sudden, like all the songs just like settled. Mm -hmm. Cause I was just thinking yeah. about playing the song, not thinking about playing a song like somebody else. Sure. Right. Right. And I guess just along those lines of like, the, I, not every gig in Nashville is like that. David is super cool that like, yeah, I mean, kind of get the vibe of the record, but, you guys aren't the guys that played on the record. Play it like you would play it. Yeah. You know? Mm hmm So that's not really an answer to your question. No, of, it but is. I, I guess anytime I've been able to work with David or anybody in the studio or live, like sometimes David will bring like a work tape to sound check and be like, hey, let's just kind of vibe on this, see what happens. Yeah. I wasn't always like this, but probably in the last five or six, seven years, when I'm working on – so, uh, someone's song I try to not think about what I'm playing at all and just do what comes natural because I feel like drummers a lot of times maybe all musicians but drummers seem to like really hyper focus on like oh, how cool can I make this beat but like when I think of any song that has an emotional effect on me I can't tell you what the drums do because like I'm, I'm not listening to what the drums are doing. The whole song is affecting me on a very emotional level. Hmm. So yeah. I try and think of like, what is the best thing? And it's hard to do at first when you're like noodling through something and trying to find something. But like, I try to think like, well, what was David hearing or whoever, but I'll use him as an example. Like what was he hearing in his head when he wrote this? And he, he wasn't going like, oh, it'd be really cool if he played like a parroted little thing here. He's like, no, man. He wants it to feel a certain way. Totally. And he wants it to have a certain kind of space. So yeah. I think like drummers, when you stop thinking about notes and think more about like, I hate this word, but like think more about the vibe yeah. <laughs> of, of what you're trying to create, it will change how you play music with people. Sure. And that's kind of what both of you guys said. I mean, you br you bring your own thing to the table, and you you're 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 bringing vibe. You're, neither one of you have used examples of, of playing paradiddles or like, oh, I'm going to do heritage on my on both kick drums while I'm <laughs> yeah. working on some polyrhythms. Over I mean, here. and obviously, like some genres, well, you can get away with that because the point of the music is to be technical. Right. Well, but and, and and conversely, those genres wouldn't be authentic if they just had some <clears> dude going. Yeah, right. Like Steve you Jordan know. is a badass. We all agree, of yes. course. But if he was on the Dream Theater gig. Uh, hang on, I would like now. to see that. Wait, hang on, uh, yes, I, know I would too. But you know, what I'm, you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah he would come in and just be like, "I'm going to play four on the floor and lay my backbeat really far back, yeah, yeah. and, and you're going to love it. And you're going to love <laughs> yeah. it." Gonna but, love but like, and the dance of attorney has never sounded like that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> just blowing straight through all the time changes, yeah, 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 like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> just right through it. You're like, but 
Uh. It gives John Petrucci a lot of room to just do whatever he wants. <laughs> but you know space. what I'm saying? Yeah, like all the space. Space. some some genres that's more acceptable than others. But like th- that's a perfect example of like Dream Theater is a technically great band. I'm not hating on any of them. They've never made a piece of music that's really affected me on an emotional level. I get you. That like makes me think of someone or something or like you know like. They don't, I don't know. Maybe maybe to some people they do. Like Rush has fans like that, I guess. But, oh, 100%. But yeah. My buddy is good lord. That's Mr. also Rush. not a band that I've yeah. ever listened to and been able to get into past like, oh, they're really technically accomplished. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. It doesn't it just doesn't speak to me. And it it and you know like most music that speaks to me on that level, I don't even know who the drummer is. Yeah. I don't care. I get it. You know what I mean? Sure. Oh, dude, I mean, you know, one of my favorites is is uh, like a lot of people Willie Nelson of course yeah. and I mean so many songs of his that literally get me crying like it's literally just Paul or his brother Billy now God rest Paul yeah. um, mm. just on a snare drum no there's not they don't even have anything sitting there except a, a cross stick and brushes and it has right. nothing to do with what yeah oh this is you know that's nothing you know in terms of <laughs> difficulty but yeah. like it had nothing to do with it because it, it, the song like you're saying makes you feel a certain way yeah there's nothing, I mean, very seldom. I mean, there's a few where you go, and somebody goes, and you go, <laughs> oh, holy cow, I got it. That's yeah. awesome. You know, well, but, sure. Like, but, that affects you on, like, a drum or Yeah, level, yeah, yeah, but that's not but, what we're talking about here. Yeah, like, yeah. I don't I don't like to listen to music as a drummer. I get you. I think you go through phases. Like, when I started playing, I would just put on a record or turn on the radio and, like, play the songs that I liked, right? I didn't care about how – I wasn't very – technically accomplished so i couldn't play anything that hard anyway right but like you can play like which is like the heart that's like the cool beat that you learn right sure Mm -hmm. so you just put on like a record that you like and play to that and then as you start to get better i feel like you start to listen to more music that is more about that and I, I like I don't know if you're studying like jazz in college or whatever you definitely go through a phase or just studying music in general where you're like I got to listen to like the people that play the hardest stuff sure ever. yeah mm. and that's cool and then you go man it's like it's not cool I don't know like it's the music the music is boring sure the notes are going by really fast and like it's super impressive that you can do that and I understand it took a long time to learn how to do that yeah well, your your aural palette changes. Yeah, just yeah. like your taste palette. I've really I've really tried to work hard like the last fifteen years, probably like about the time I moved here to like go back to being able to listen to music as like someone who doesn't play music. Hmm. Well, you like know what that. I mean? Because like, have that. you ever like talked to someone and they'll they'll like throw out a band and they, and they're like that band is their life and you're like man they suck, <laughs> but but it's like not fair to say they suck because they obviously affect that person on an emotional level. Maybe Mm -hmm. they don't speak to you and maybe you're being a snob because, well, I don't think they're very good, but it really, what's the John Cusack that movie? Uh, Oh, where they're working at the record store. And Oh, uh, uh, high fidelity. Nothing's good enough. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah. Like my wife loves that. movie. It's a good, (laughs) it's a great flick, but, uh, (laughs) I, I, does that make sense? Like to just try and listen to music, for the joy of listening to music and not hyper focus on one thing that's happening in a song. All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna flip the coin here though. I, I we could talk about Desert Island CDs or whatever, <laughs> but I want to hear one song that emotionally impacted you and that you also just fell head over heels for the drumming. I can tell you Ooh. mine. I mean, man, I could t- I mean I could list a bunch, but like uh, uh, Peter Gabriel in your eyes. Uh, to me, watching Manu play is like watching Barishnikov dance or mm-hmm. you know, sure. l- looking at a Rembrandt. I mean, and that those drum parts, I know it wasn't just Manu on that track, but still <clears throat> yeah. that that drum part to me, I've I have I have dissected it upside, you know, sideways, backwards, forwards for years. In fact, when I first started driving up to Nashville trying to figure out if I could move here and how I was gonna do it, whatever, I had I had this old beat up Dodge caravan and uh I dangerously drove with one hand on the wheel. My left hand would just be banging on the steering wheel with a drumstick, you know, and I would just play along to that, to those, to those parts the whole time. And so that's one song where I can't, 
I can't separate the drumming, the passion in the drumming and the impact of the song for me. Yeah. You know? Sure. Well, actually, you know, it's funny and I'm not doing this just cause I love you. Ah, uh, go ahead. I'm not going to mention you, but <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> the, uh, there's a Peter Gabriel record. Is it us? Uh, yeah. Dude. In the, uh, is it please come talk to me? Is that the first yeah, song? Yeah, Come talk to me. Yeah, dude. The, so the live version of that, the live Secret version, live? yeah, Secret where they come up out of the stage. Because that song, yeah. I really love this. I really love the lyrics mm-hmm. of that song, and like just th- like the uh, the feeling it creates. Mm-hmm. But the live version, man, like he, that's a great drumming song that uh, also does that thing. Yeah, yeah. I'm not saying they're not out there. Of course, of course. I, uh, I'm just thinking like, like you know, you can pick like like of any Beatles song Mm -hmm. and I'm not dissing on Ringo. Like if you don't like Ringo, I probably don't want to be your friend. Yeah. But like he didn't do anything super technical, but the, the vibe he creates within that song is what makes the song so heavy for you as a listener. You know what I'm saying? Mm. To me, that's like the ultimate goal. Yeah, I agree. I totally agree. Or to even like take like a, uh, like a, like a current band, like Coldplay or something, okay? That dude's probably not like a super great drummer. I don't know. Maybe he is. But, but like, he doesn't do anything, oh, like, outstanding on the records. But some of those songs create, like, a mood that it's, like, really hard to not, like, settle in and just listen to what he's saying. Totally. Yeah. And has, and has nothing to do with the drumming, right? Larry Millen Jr. Oh, that's a that's Another a good one. Yes, like yeah. yeah. You know, I, I'm not the biggest U2 fan at all, it, or that there is. You know, by yeah. any means. But, but that's you know, a that's a good example. Larry plays perfect for the song. Every yeah, time. he does. And yeah. it every always time. creates that ocean that you can just listen yeah. to them mm-hmm. just play on top of, and it's so. Yeah, I mean, along great. those lines, have you ever been in a like a cover band and tried to do with or without you and get it to build the way he does? Uh, impossible. It's I, impossible. Yeah, yeah. It really is. Yeah, it's impossible. You, you you immediately go into it. Uh, at least for me, uh, you go in uh, like a almost like a an attitude like teenager would have. Like, well, it's going to be a lot of sixteenth notes and the hi hats, and that's it. And like, <laughs> yeah. that's like totally wrong attitude right. to have when you're yeah. you're going into those type situations. Of course, because I mean, yeah. good lord, he's a brilliant player. And yeah, music, and musician too. Yeah. He, he doesn't just play drums. I don't think. I, that's why I've always loved Stuart Copeland. You know, yeah, he's he's yeah. one of my favorite drummers of all time. I mean, yeah. He's just a well-rounded musician, and and he sounds exactly and only like Stuart Copeland. Dude, yeah. and well, I, you just can't you can't deny it. What's the tune they hired him just for the hi hats? Is Peter Gabriel? Well, tune? it's Peter Gabriel. Yeah, yeah. It, it was uh, Red Rain because he had the. It was like I need that Stuart and Copeland. That's, yeah, hi hat feel. Hey, let me tell you something. If you, if I could ever play the hi hat intro uh, to every little thing she does is magic the way that he played mm. it. I would, I'd just retire. Maybe. I would be like, man, if I could make it sound like that, I'd be like, I'm done. Yeah. You know, it's just there's something, no point. So something about the yeah. guy. You yeah. Know? You guys, um, not to switch topics, but a, mm. a few minutes ago, you guys were talking about something that was very, very cool. I thought about, you said, you know, you got, you have to bring yourself to a gig or else, you know, there's a lot of guys that can do it, you know, so bring yourself. And then you said a thing about when you, you, you didn't forcefully say it, but you said, I'm going to, I need to play like me. So this <clears> goes this sort of way. I think personally, I think that is something very important that young drummers should be aware of is that it's, it, you know, you never even want to be rude, of course. And if you lose the gig, that's very unfortunate. But I think it is very important and kind of like Larry London used to do, like Larry would stand up for himself. And maybe it would be in mm-hmm. a way that, you know, now would definitely get you fired. But, <laughs> but um, he was Larry. He was Larry. Gosh. But like, it's important to yeah. be confident in your, your own abilities and your own self and don't get walked over. And it made me think because this picture of you sitting next to Jerry. Jerry oh gosh, I know. Uh, hilarious. Jerry is is my favorite drummer on earth. But Jerry Croon, has, there's great stories about Jerry doing things like this. But one in particular that stands out in my mind of, of Jerry standing up for himself was just an old, just an old demo session here in town somewhere. And and the story goes like they were saying, you know, you need to play it like this guy, and you need to play it like that guy. And Jerry's resume is as long as you know my sure. arm. Yeah. And so Jerry, you know, and very confident, said, you know, I'm gonna. This is how I'm gonna, it needs to be played. This is how I'm going to play it and all that you hired me. You know, this is how it's going to work. And I think uh, from what I understand, the story goes like Jerry just throws the headphones down after the guy <laughs> says one more thing on his snare drum. And the guy says, hey, whoa, 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 Jerry, where, where are you going? The session's not over. And Jerry picks his keys up out of his stick bag and says, I still got these. 
Session's over. <laughs> and, then, and then he like walks out, to the, left his kit, left the, everything there for cards to deal with. And like everybody's sitting there like with their phones and charts. Well, I guess that, I guess the yeah. day's over, boys. Because like, yeah. he wow. wasn't going to be walked over like that yeah. anymore. And did he lose any work from it? And good Lord, no. He's still <laughs> Jerry Croon, right? right. Yeah. So I'm not, I'm not suggesting you just tell the producer to, to stick it, <clears throat> you know, sure. if they have suggestions. But don't just, don't just kids, walk, get walked over just because, you know. Yeah you can't stand it or whatever I, it is. I, I don't want to make it out like Blaine, the bass player. He wasn't like being a jerk, but it was just that, you know, Hubert had been on that gig for like a year and a half. So it's just what he was used to. He wasn't sure. hearing maybe some cues or something that he was just, that he never thought about not yeah. hearing. Right. And I, I think he just didn't know how to articulate. Sure. Like, so all he could say was like, well, Hubert used to play it like this. And I eventually just had to say, well, man, yeah. I'm not Hubert. Yeah. Like, but then, but then, how how great was the gig? Oh, it, when, when that got brought up, yeah, it got it, it got moved, so much better. It moved yeah, forward. So yeah. you you had you and, were very polite because you are, well, um, but not you, always. You said the thing that needed to be said, and and sometimes it's not the easiest thing to do. But then it's ama- It's better, and it was yeah. better for the whole band, which is what this is all. And about. And it, it was a weird situation because David didn't seem unhappy, and he wasn't the one coming to me. Yeah. But it's like, well, I you know Blaine's been here longer. Sure. I understand he he wanted to be a certain way. But it definitely, all of a sudden, it like it made me go, okay, I'm, I don't think I'm going to lose this gig for that because I could tell that David was responding mm-hmm. uh, in a, in a positive way to like what was happening, and yeah. it just seemed that everyone else, like the whole gig, just went. <sighs> yeah, mm-hmm. and you you had to be the one as the bus driver because that's what drivers yeah. are a lot of times, right? Yeah. You we've got to say those things because yeah. you don't want to go into a gig. And just be like, well, this is how I do it. And, you know, no, my way to have, you can't do that. But you you read the room because you didn't immediately yeah. do that. No, I didn't. I, I mean, yeah. And if you're smart, you won't. Yeah. I mean, because <laughs> is, like you said, you know, a few minutes ago, so brilliantly, like, yeah, the, the chops and everything really isn't it. It's, it's really about the interpersonal relationship. Man, it really is. And so reading those interpersonal relationships <laughs> and, and like, you're going to, like we said a minute ago, you're going to be on the bus all day looking at each other. You're not going to be going that actually right. <laughs> for, for all day that's, you know that that's makes me that makes me think of another thing so going back to my fanboyism of you but like i think it was in 03 dc talk released like the 10 year anniversary of uh free at last right yeah and so there was a movie made there was on that tour yeah that was not the concert video i saw but like an actual movie long story short at the end of that movie like after the credits roll there's a black and white clip of you guys on the bus driving home. Uh, I think it's the last night of the tour. So you guys are just like cutting up. Yeah. And that was like another thing where I just like, man, that look, that looks like so much fun. Like you're just hanging with your friends on a tour bus. There's like cereal boxes everywhere. <laughs> you guys are just like cutting it up and having a good time. Yeah. And that's like, that's what being on a gig is really about. And that's what I always tell people that, that maybe don't know much about that world. Like yeah. that, that they, they really think too much about like, well, he didn't hire me cause he didn't like my playing or I'm not getting any. And it's like, man, it's not always about the playing. Like there's obviously a certain level you, you have to be at when you go to an audition. But like if, the other dudes in the band or if the artist just doesn't feel like, I don't, yeah. you know, 90 minutes is, is playing the gig. Right. It's the other 20, 22 and a half oh hours yeah. of the day. Like you're going to be like in a cleanup room with these people right. in a really tiny green, uh, green room. You're going to be like playing well is almost the common denominator. You can't even factor it in. Yeah. You ha- you yeah. yeah. Have to. That's it's like understood. <laughs> so the, 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 you got to play well, put that away. Right. Everything else is is what you do. You know, it's like, it's like, man, can I go like hang at a ballpark with this dude for totally. three hours, or <laughs> like, like yeah. you know, like, can I just have a beer with this guy, or is he going to be super annoying? Like, speaking of which, ballparks. I've heard that you don't like the Phillies. That's probably not true. I was just trying to get well, him. Oh, they will. It was uh, nice knowing you. <laughs> yeah, they they play baseball, right? I thought they used what? to, but I, I, anyway, I, I don't know anything about them. Somebody them. somebody <laughs> yesterday said you should try to get him in a sports fight, and I was like, all right, so I'll see if I can bring him. <laughs> Do, I was kidding. Are you even a sports guy? Yeah, I'm, are a, you really? I'm a football guy though. No. I grew up in South Georgia. Oh, that yeah, and, and the Braves, you know, for, for a long time were 
just nothing to talk about, you know. But uh, I am I've I've been diehard George Bulldogs fan, always will be. So, but I mean, I like baseball and sure. I love football. I love pro football too. Yeah. But you know, college is my thing. Do you have a favorite ballpark? Baseball. Yeah, park? I do actually. Uh, uh, it used to be Candlestick. I think it's AT and T park out oh, in san francisco san i haven't been to that one uh yet. the Man. reason uh purely uh dumb guy reason uh they sell garlic french fries there <laughs> and the whole the whole stadium smells like a oh. garlic clove and it's right on the water yeah you know? it's yeah. right there on the water it's yeah. a beautiful place so the, going there is a i think is a pretty cool experience that's overall. that's on my list I've, I've been to about 15 so i'm mm. halfway there yeah yeah um I, th- I think that was uh that was one of the things on the road for me uh was you know, on days off. I mean, I loved going if, if we were in a bigger city, going to a sports event, you know, go seeing a team play, you know, yeah. and uh, and hanging with the guys that I was out on the road with. You know, it was a real, not a test, but it was like, man, you find out quickly if you really enjoy being out yeah, on the road with those guys. It can be a real drag if the dude, like, man, I'm making great music, but I really hate these dudes as or people. All they do like, is gripe all the time. Yeah. Or whatever. Oh, oh, and dude, I think I mean, we've probably all been in bands. I always I have this thing that I say where it's like every band, has an asshole. Mm. And if you think you're lucky enough to be in a band that doesn't have one, guess what? <laughs> you're the <laughs> you're asshole. The <laughs> so, ah, like... I'm writing that down. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, there's, I think there's always going to be, like, that one dude who's, like, a darker kind of guy and is maybe negative. But there are some that you're just like, dude, I cannot take any more of this. Like, we're literally on a bus getting paid to play music. Yeah. Like, there's... I don't know what is bad about this. Yeah, it's always it's always baffled me. I, it really has. I I mean, you know, for all my many faults and character flaws, I have always been able to perspective wise see a bigger picture. Man, I am playing drums right now, yeah, and I'm making money playing drums. I haven't always enjoyed the you know the circumstances that surround it, or sometimes people uh, just whatever the situation itself may not be the easiest. I may not be that into the music, but I mean, man, if you can't just sit down to the drums and forget everything else, you know that's happened that day. I mean, if you lose that, I mean, dude, I'm 51 now. I am 51. I still get so excited. You know, acorn tip on a dark you know heavy like ride some i get so excited you know yeah. and if i if i stop feeling that way i don't think it's going to be because of the music industry or anything else i i just feel like if i lose that then i i don't i don't need to be playing drums you know yeah. i don't need to be playing music um uh and and i and I'll, man i'll be completely honest with you La- my last like heavy duty touring gig i um you know personally i was I was just not in a great place and uh, I wasn't I, I it really kind of became a job to me and I wasn't super well versed in the in the music itself and I just I just couldn't keep it I couldn't I couldn't keep the gig because I I lost a little bit of that and and I man I hate that I let it get there for me on on that level you know I really do and I'm not that guy anymore cuz I still love playing drums I get to play you know sessions and and I'm still doing some live stuff but I'm, I I work with my wife on her stuff and yeah. I love playing drums. I, I really do. And I don't ever want to get to that place again where I let the other circumstances and and the very harsh realities of the music industry and stuff, you know, overtake the fact that I still love to play, you know. Yeah. So anyway how do you guys keep because you know like when you worked here you, you know yeah you, you hear so many amazing stories and get to be friends with so many amazing heroes and players but there's also unfortunately the guys out there that have that we've all you know we've all had the, the gigs where we're like you know god you know screw this i'm gonna sell my drums tomorrow you know we've all been in that little hole but how do you guys because you know you hear mumblings around obviously because we're in an unprecedented time right now how do you guys oh, you know, I'm I'm very lucky to call both of you friends um, over the years. How and you both, at least in here, uh, maintain a positive veneer. So how <laughs> how do you guys maintain your love for that acorn stick on a dark ride, or or wanting to order a new Gretsch kit? How do you guys? How oh, do you man, guys main? You. It's going to be beautiful too. That <laughs> I thing. Can't wait, dude. Shout out to Gretsch drums, killer yes, drums right, coming up. Right. Um, how do you guys maintain, at least for right now, or are you maintaining um, consciously that sort of? Um, childlike excitement mm. for drums during times where maybe all of us aren't playing all the time. I mean, you know, I haven't played my drums personally in a long time now. So 
Yeah, I mean, you know, you've got a home studio, I know, and I'm sure I do. I do track some at home. Yeah, so, so mm-hmm. does, I'm sure that helps. But like, how do you how do you guys maintain that magic for you know somebody who may watch this and say, well, I'm just I'm not having too much fun playing drums anymore. Like, like how do you how are you guys maintaining while we're not getting to go out and play <laughs> high up Pisces on pearl kits <laughs> like we used to do? Not that there's anything wrong with that. Yeah. Um, Smooth white emperors too. Right? Yeah, oh, <laughs> always, man. Those Gosh. help. <laughs> yeah, those do. <laughs> wow, because that I mean, look. The truth of the matter is, I think, it's harder than ever. And it's not just the COVID crazy and all this other stuff. I mean, before all this hit, it was harder yeah. to me than ever to make a living yeah. as a musician. And uh, I have soapboxed many times, you know, to people. I have I have preached, you know, about, about, you know, why we're in this place and what's changed and how things were different. And, yeah, I'm, oh, gosh, I've become that guy back in my day, you know. We, you know, we did all this and had all this going. And now, um, I mean, it is harder to be enthusiastic about, you know, the prospects when I talk to younger guys who are wanting to move to town or, you know, thinking about, hey, what do I do? How do I do this? Man, I'm not sure that I can even answer the question fully. I don't know that anyone can. You have to kind of figure out your own way. Mm -hmm. But, I I mean, man, it is – I I really think it comes back to just – and I'm not trying to sound Pollyanna. I mean, if you love the music, if you love – if you – get excited and inspired and i think i think it's possible to let the cynicism and and despair overtake that i think you can lose it i've lost it i mean we've all lost it from time to time absolutely and i think it i i think you you know without being a a, an accredited therapist or whatever you (laughs) just have to be able to get to a point where you can remember why you wanted to do it in the first place and sometimes that might be not playing drums for a month and coming back fresh it might be I don't know, changing heads, get a, get a new perspective, set it up backwards or, sure. uh, you know, whatever you got yeah. to do. But, um, I, I mean, I always, I, when I was in college, I remember, uh, I'm not sure I always achieved this, but whenever I sat down to the drums for a practice session, I told myself, man, I don't want to be the same player when I stand back up. Mm. You know, I don't want to be the same guy I was. And I mean, and it's so easy to fall into the same routines when you sit down to play the stuff that's familiar. It sounds great. Oh man, I, I dig me. Look at me. I can do this. <laughs> but then you really haven't grown. You know, you can, you just kind of reinforce where you've already been. I think there's just ways you just got to listen to new music. You've got to just get outside your comfort zone. And even saying that, man, I know that doesn't pay bills. I know that yeah. doesn't change the, the reality. Of course. But you're not going to you're not going to pay the bills unless you can get back to that place. Yep. Does that make sense? It totally makes sense. I, um cuz I mean, I think it can be such a you said you're not a therapist, but I think that was there was actually a lot of great therapy that people can can that you said that um that people can pull out of drumming and when you lose that and you don't have that place to go to even the darker times can be even darker if you don't you know because there was no darker time than me than 20 years ago when i didn't even want to sit on a drum set yeah and it was like yeah i was in a situation where it was like all the time and i just hated playing and i hated sitting at them i hated even hearing them or talking about them (laughs) and it's like wait a minute this is what I love to do. Right. You know, so I think like you said just a second ago, sort of trying to revisit why you did it. And because none of us hated drums when we were 12 and 13 years old, no. you know? Um, so like you said, it was quite brilliant getting back to what was the first reason, you know, who was your, you know, whatever it is, well, first year or anything. Even going back to that mindset you asked about, or like going into a gig, I, there's no question you're going to play your personality you're you are some way shape or form your personality it sneaks into your plane even if you are uh, in a situation where you're supposed to completely replicate parts that were already there or that somebody else had done and they really you're you, you can't help it you're going to play your personality and if you're if you're healthy inside i mean i feel like that comes out if uh I mean, and again, I go back to the to my last touring gig. I mean, I was just in a bad place, you know, and I wasn't enjoying it. And it wasn't the music's <clears> fault. It, it wasn't at all. It was it was on me. And I let I let a lot of things just kind of overtake me. And uh, and man, I, gosh, I lost that gig after a year and a half, and that yeah. was hard. It was yeah. really hard. Yeah. But but at the same time, it was hard. Uh, and I even even in losing the gig, it was hard because I was only thinking about the financial aspect of it or oh man god i got fired god that sucks you know what are people going to think instead I, I i what i should have thought is man i was playing some really great music you know and i had uh, guys around me that i loved and that's what i lost you know mm-hmm. yeah. and um 
And so I've had I've had a lot of you know times since then I've recalibrated and I feel like I'm in a better place you know with that mindset. But but man, I mean even the stupid China symbol thing I told you. I mean that was just part of my personality. There was a part of me that just kind of didn't care a little bit, you know. And I was like, I'm going to do this. I got to do something right. that's different. Yeah. That's yeah. you know, um, and I, I hope that my personality isn't equated to a China symbol <laughs> these days. Gosh, am I? I heard some musical friendly China. Yeah. I know I'm not I'm not into <laughs> China. I mean yeah. that was in the nineties. Right, well, like the China's were, they were still a thing then. Like people were still using them. What do you mean then? I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm pretty sure Jeff Hamilton's swinging on oh, top of one right fair. now. That's fair. That's <laughs> fair. Man, you know what I always wanted to do? I always said my last gig when I'm ready to just you know pack it in, I'm just going to show up with the gig all China symbols, oh, like dude. China hats, everything. It's all going to be Chinas, and I'm just going to lay into it, Trey Gray style. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes, but don't, like uh, just don't even acknowledge it. Just act it. like nothing's wrong. Like what? Yeah, dude. yeah. Trey will play anything anytime if he feels it he's playing that drum set you're like hey, yeah trey what are you yeah what are you doing three 12 inch toms with different heads <laughs> yes. that are all tuned the same he's like <laughs> uh-huh yes you're yes. like i get it this yeah. is awesome yeah and that's a that's a that's a perfect example of personality yeah personality coming through yeah yeah he he is and he i mean he's had amazing gigs because of it I mean, yeah. That's a, yeah that's a guy who always makes everyone feel like God, their family every time. Yeah, and he exactly. Definitely, he definitely does it right. He's one, you know, speaking of like people you run into at Forks, he's always one of those people that oh, yeah. if you walk in and he's here, oh, man. it's a good time, man. Yeah. 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 Without a doubt. Just don't, you know, don't go out for beers with him and, and don't toast and cheers at the same time. We had a we had a kid that worked here years ago and we all went out and it was like, Trey was like, I'm taking everybody out. And we're like, let's go hang with Trey. You know, it's going to be fun. So we went out and we're all sitting there and we have, everybody has a round and, and this interpersonal band politics, right? This is a good lesson to learn on the road for young guys that are, you know, how do I keep a gig or whatever? So we're all sitting there at, you know, the restaurant drinking a couple beers and we have the first round. And then the second round comes out and uh, the younger kid in question that used to work here, it says, uh, just starts taking pulls off of the second beer. And Trey looks over at him. He goes, we didn't toast yet, dude. Oh, and, and so he was like, oh, oh, dude, I'm sorry. He tries to hold it up. He's like, no, 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 no. He's yeah. like, miss. A round of beers on the kid. The next round's on him. It's like, man, you know. So you got to watch those interpersonal Dang, politics, yeah, right, you know. Right. So for sure. So you it's know, a minefield. You, Let me got, you got you go out with Trey. You know, make sure you're toasting like at the appropriate times. For sure. I'll remember that. I'll Don't, log that away. Because you'll Gosh. get a, you'll get a bill at the end of the night. Yeah, <laughs> it'll cost you literally. Yeah. <laughs> well, man, I you know you guys have been very patient sitting here without our air conditioning running. I'm sweating like a hog for sure. <laughs> a little um, what are you guys? What are you guys wanting? Where are we going next? What's next for you? Or is there anything next for us? Because there's nothing next for me. On my Man, calendar, just, so I'm just gonna wear a mask and mind my business, which is important. Yeah, yeah, for sure. <laughs> I, don't, for sure. I don't know. Man. Wear your mask. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Be safe out there. And yeah, are you guys recording any cool stuff at home? Any projects either one of you guys are working on with anyone? Um, I was telling Matt I had my first COVID session here in town <laughs> uh, about two weeks ago. We were all wearing masks, mm -hmm. um, and uh, it was actually an interesting session. It was a songwriter songwriting session, but w the last song of the day was. Um, I feel ill prepared to tell you about this because I wish I could tell you the guy's name, but there was a police officer here in town who uh, is a very accomplished songwriter. Um, and he came in for the last song of the session. He had uh, written a song um, about the George Floyd incident mm -hmm. and everything and, and a policeman's perspective on it. And uh, man, it was a very moving song. He And the, the theme of the chorus was to the effect of, man, you know, I know you didn't want this kind of fame and, and I hate that this is how we know your name. And it was, man, it was just such a moving song. Um, I told Matt, I basically put some towels over the drums and just played pop, <laughs> pop. And it was just, but, but anyway, the song is actually going to be released in about a week. They're doing a music video for it mm -hmm. and, and they're really going to try to, you know, to release it to promote some healing and, you yeah. know, and just to bring some, I don't know, just, uh, I think I think an important perspective from the police officer side of it, okay. you know, uh, and uh, and I got to play on that. So that was a that was a really cool experience for me, even though I had you know had to wear a mask the whole time. And well, everybody is. I mean, I everyone see, is. I see yeah. everybody posting on their Instagram, yeah, sitting behind exactly. drums, like here we are, a COVID session. You <laughs> yeah, know? exactly. Um, 
What about you, Ice? Any new Spider Wolf tunes or anything we should yeah, all be there, aware there's about? Some, there's some stuff uh, <laughs> that's brewing there. TJ's actually in town this week, I think, cutting some vocals. And I haven't heard from him. Yeah. Mm. Well, he texted me once like a week ago. That's the last I heard, oh, so maybe he didn't want to see me. No, I get it. His <laughs> birthday was recently. Maybe he's still... I don't even know that. I'm in a band with the guy, and I don't know his birthday. Yeah. Well, I, I wouldn't know it if I didn't see it come yeah. through Facebook, you yeah. know, so I sent him a text I'm message. But anymore. That's yeah. a good way to be. Yeah, yeah bump that. I'm about to quit Instagram, too, I think. Okay. Mm. Uh, man, social Just, media, like... Somebody, somebody out there, convince me why I should stay, and then I'll, I'll think about it. But Michael Keaton is recast as Batman in the Flash movie, and that was on social media. That's a reason. I, that's pretty valid. To it's going to take more than that, I think. Mm. <laughs> Sorry, the return of the bat isn't going to be good enough. All right, uh, that's fine. That's fine. No, I, anyway, <laughs> yeah, Spider Man's got some stuff. Uh, we just moved. Yes, my, my wife and I we moved up to Hendersonville like three weeks ago, but. Right before we moved at my old place, I just tracked uh, a song for David. Nice. Uh, and it was a very cool experience. Like, he, he sent me this song by another band. He was like, can you kind of, like, do a loop that's, like, got this kind of thing going? So I, like, tracked everything, like, the hi-hat individually, you know, one one at a time and pieced it all together and kind of cut up and sent him a loop. But then I did, like, a live drum thing over it. I hadn't even heard the song. He just said, I've got this song. I'm trying to play it over the loop on this song just to hear it, but like that's obviously impossible. So I sent him a loop and I said, Hey, I kind of like edited it in like the form of a song, like a three minute song, like what I thought it might be like. And I said, Hey, at the end, I just did like a live drum thing over it. Cause I didn't know if it was going to like get epic or if it was going to stay kind of chill. And then he cut this, they went and cut it at Reed's place, the keyboard player. And they sent it to me like three days later. It's like the coolest sounding thing ever. Not wow. not because I'm on it. Like just the song is super cool. So I'm hoping because that, he's on it. No, well, <laughs> that's what I'm hearing. So, yeah. <laughs> I'm hoping that that becomes <laughs> something that maybe gets released because oh, I've oh, man, I've recorded so. a few things. <laughs> I've recorded a few things with David, but it's always been like on an acoustic setup, yeah. which is still cool. But to actually like be on a record with him, like playing drums, would be. That'd be pretty cool for me. What's well, a that's a huge deal because I mean yeah. very similar to what you're yeah. talking about, yeah. you know, playing on Steven stuff. I mean, that's a we as drummers and we all know this in this town. I mean, we a lot of times we don't get to play on the band's CDs or vice versa. You know, you play on a band CD and then you don't go out on the road. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. You so never see him again. You never right. see him again. So, you know, to be actually involved in both sides, sure. that's like both of you guys I have know. awesome. That's huge, you know. Yeah. So, I did that and then we moved and I've got a space that's going to become the studio at the new house. Right. It's kind of up and running now but like it's not exactly how i want it to. like eventually i'm gonna put a hardwood floor yeah. and treat the walls a little bit but i you, can do tracks for people you got everyone two, listening is a drummer so they don't care you got yeah. two, you got two kick drum mics over there <laughs> of course i have like four kick drum mics over so there. i know where i'm going next time <laughs> all right please do because <laughs> oh, yeah. i'll just take a lesson well he, oh, uh, from the freaking garbage as well <laughs> before me <laughs> so do you guys have any questions for each other before we let all the folks go hmm what cologne are you wearing? I do not wear okay. cologne. <laughs> All right. It itches. It, like, Dude, it, I'm not it, a fan. And my wife has always said I have a great natural musk, so I don't wear <laughs> Oh, my gosh. I've known you for a while. Sorry I, I said true. that. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, dudes. Well, uh, I, I was trying to think. Go ahead. If you, I don't, I mean. Well, uh, I don't know if I, if I have a question per se, maybe a, a comment. Uh, you know, I remember meeting you at Forks, you know. Yeah, you know, I was going to tell that story, but I well, kind of. I'll, I'll let you. No. I'll let you tell. I just remember from from that point, you know, uh, and you know, I just remember, um, you know, getting some Vietnamese food with you, you know, not too long ago. It's been it's been too long, but it not that been. long yes, ago. Yes. And I just I you know man I just want to say, uh, you know I'm I'm glad that we could talk about drums, you know, as we obviously did that yeah. day, which was a lot of fun, but. You know, I appreciate you being just a real human being to me, you know. And I, man, I mean, I'm a fan of your playing. I have been for a while. I've listened. You've sent me some videos that I've just <laughs> dug and I've watched you play. And, I mean, I, I, I really am. And I, 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 I'm thankful that we can be, you know, drumming buzz. But I'm, I appreciate you as a person as well. Uh, well, so. that, and that's what I was going to say. And you made me think of this story when you were – talking about going to that concert and walking up to the drummer and then him being like, right. Oh, he want to turn on my kit. And then he <laughs> just leaves. Um, yeah. So that story, well, I moved to Nashville in 06 shortly after that, 
I'd only been here maybe a couple months. You were playing at Third and Lindsley with somebody. I have no idea who the artist was. The only reason I wanted to go is because I knew you were playing. <laughs> wow. Because, so it's a funny story. When I was in college in Philly in 04, my mom called me and she was like, hey, I'm going to go see Stephen Curtis Chapman in like a month. And I was like, I can't believe my mom is going to go see my drumming hero play <laughs> live before I've gotten to. <laughs> oh, man. Anyway, so I went to that gig, but I was like, the third and Lizzie gig. I went to that gig. I sat in the back, watched you play. It was great. But I was like, I really wanted to come up and talk to you. But at that time, and I'm still like this to an extent with, with somebody. Like, I don't really get starstruck, but I feel very like reverential around people that that are like better than me in pros. And it's like, I don't want to go up and be that guy that's like, oh, man, you sound so great. And what are you playing? What are you doing there? Like, like you're working and I don't want to be in your space. You know what I mean? Like that's how I've always felt. I just want to observe and, and like make my mental notes and then leave. But like a year or two later, I walked into forks and as you were walking out with like a handful of heads (laughs) and I was kind of like, look, it didn't really dawn on me. And then I got to the counter and Dennis was working and I was like, dude, was that, was that Will Denton? He was like, yeah, he just came in here to buy heads. I was like, man, that was like my chance. And I was like so bummed that I didn't say anything. And for what I think you came back because you forgot to get a kick drum head like five minutes later. I'm sure I forgot something. I always forget something when I come here. So I was like, all right, don't don't be a goon, Ice, but like you have to say something. (laughs) And so you were walking down from the back and I just stopped you and I was like, hey, Will, this is going to sound really awkward, but like. You are literally the reason I play drums and live in Nashville. I, I remember I, that. I just wanted to say, me. like, thank you. And I think I had, like, an old flip phone, and we took a picture. <laughs> yeah, I think Dennis took the picture. Yeah. And I was like, dude, that's the coolest thing ever. I just met, like, my drumming hero. Like, oh, my gosh. If nothing else ever happens in Nashville for me, like, that's super cool. And I've gotten to know you, actually, over the years. And now we've hang, we hang out and yeah. text each other and whatever. Like, like we know each other as people and like what you just said, I, I don't really, we could have talked all day about gear, yeah. but I don't really care that much anymore. Like gear is gear. And if you really love what you're playing, then great. Right. Uh, I really love you as a person. Oh man. And like <laughs> we, we had some, like some deep conversations and we really, I don't know. It just, I don't feel like everyone always gets to meet their hero and that they're like a super cool guy, but like you've never been anything but just like open with your time and just cool. And it 12 year old me like is crying right now. So <laughs> oh, it, it, it makes awesome. it, it, it makes a big difference, man. I don't, you know, it's a bummer if you meet your hero and they're a butthead, <laughs> you know? Wow. You know, um, you. that's kind of the magic of, of that's kind of the great part of the magic of, of, of this town. What, you mm-hmm. know, I mean, you know, everybody can say this or that about Broadway and whatever, but there really is something special that a lot of us, uh, maybe if we do it too much, we look, me, I can definitely say I have taken it for granted about getting to meet Jerry Croon and hang yeah. out with him or, or getting to know your heroes in this town especially. And that was something that Gary really fostered with all of us, I think. He really at, did. You know, he, he took the time to hang out with you in that photo, you know, mm-hmm. with all those guys. And those are just old buddies, you know, and they yeah. welcome you right in, you know. And just like you've done with Ice, you know, you welcomed him right in, you know. And mm. that's huge, you know. That, it's a great thing that, that they did. And, and it's a cool part that this, I think, this town still has a lot of to Man, offer. Man, I, I hope we don't lose it. I, yeah. I really yeah. do. I, right. I've, I, you've, like, you've made me always try and be like that with, with other people. And other guys I've met, too. Like, I've really only met a couple. That have been like, man, they were kind of a jerk and that wasn't fun. But like anytime someone else is new to town, like if I meet somebody on Broadway or whatever, like mm-hmm. or I meet somebody out on the road and they're like, Hey mm-hmm. man, I'm thinking about moving to Nashville. I I just try and be as cool as possible. And that's not always the easiest thing to do because you're like sweaty after a show and you're tearing down. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. I remember being that kid that was like, Man, that guy's doing what I want to do. And he's taking the time to talk to me. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know? Like, it's not very hard to not be a jerk. Yeah. Dude, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'm sure you, both of you guys have read the Nashville. Uh, it was like in the ni- 96-ish. There was a two-part MD article with the Nashville Studio Drummers Roundtable. And it had yeah. Tommy and Jerry uh-huh. and it had Paul Lyme and all those guys. And there were Kenny Malone and then all those different folks. And they're sitting there. And, and, and very much to your point, what 
stood out to me so much at the time being a kid reading that was when Jerry was talking about when he first moved to town in that article. And he says that Larry, you know, not only did Larry either, I think it was like he picked him up at the airport or something, but then like Jerry didn't have any gear here yet. And so Larry loaned him, you know, everything, loaned him a kit, loaned him hardware, snare, everything. He's like, here kid, you know, get going, get started, you know. And then when Jerry, you know, was ready to, to either pay him back or give him stuff back, he's like, no nah, man, that's all yours. He's like, yeah. no, I don't need that stuff back. You know, you do what you have to do. You make money with that stuff. Mm -hmm. And like, holy cow, you know, Larry was definitely a huge part of the gel of that. And I think there's a lot of players, like especially like you guys and other folks that, that still do that. And it's amazing. Thank you guys for being awesome and, and being willing to be here and, and talk to each other. I know that's always weird, you know, when you put your, your hero on the spot with somebody, but thanks for both being good sports about it. Oh, today. man. Thanks for having us. Yeah, man. thank you. And Marshall, much. thank you. Thank yeah, you, guys. guys. Thank Sit, you. Sitting, everybody's sitting up here sweating together. So yeah. That's yeah. Well, yeah. So. yeah, it's great. Anyway, um, man. Uh, I mean, Forks, this is the magic of Forks. This is why Forks is awesome. Yeah. It was it was always a home for all of us growing up. Yeah. And, and hopefully way after we're all gone, it can still be here and yeah. we can all still look at those pictures of Gary and Melissa and say, Man, that was that's a special place. You know, hopefully the next generation mm -hmm. way down the road, you know, is is it still gets to have that. I yeah. hope there's still that kind of thing. I just, I just hope people dress better than than this. I'm pretty I, sure it's probably going to come back around. I feel like uh, it's already coming back around. <laughs> oh my god! It wasn't it? Wasn't never mind. I'm not going to put Simon on the spot. He may see this. <laughs> um, so anyway, I just heard some Paul stories. So um, yeah, I'll tell you off the, off the record. All right, guys. Well, thanks again for being here so much. Yeah, um, everybody nice. out there, um, check us out on all the very the varieties, excuse me, of social medias, uh, the Instagrams and the Facebooks. And if you have any questions, that we always try to field questions on these things um, or anything like that, uh, email it to podcast at forkstrimcloset.com. And um, we hope to hear from some of you very soon. Matt and Will, thank you so much for hanging yeah. out tonight on the Forks Podcast. Guys, be safe. Uh, come yeah. s come see us at, at the store anytime other than Sunday because we're, we're not there <laughs> that day. But um, anyway, thanks, dudes. Cool. Thank you. Thank you guys are the best. Thank you. <laughs>